There is so much being put out on the internet right now. Some of it true and most of it fake. There is a conflict that has been going on for so many years. And for some reason, the only thing people are talking about right now is what's going on within the past two weeks. I, for one, am sick and tired of sitting back and watching people distort truth, distort history, and not tell it like it is. And if you're sick and tired of it too, share this video. As somebody who wants a real peace, a true peace, and I want to see this conflict end, I am sick and tired of hearing the conversation going back and forth between who was here first. But you know what? The fact is, is that this area of the world, whether you call it Israel or Palestine, was the indigenous home to the Jewish people for thousands of years. King David ruled here and King Solomon built his temple here. And the fact is, is that all this occurred even before Islam existed. But as I said, I don't think it's productive to go down that route and talk about who was here first, because whichever side you agree with depends on how far back you go in history. And the fact is, the Jewish people have been suppressed, oppressed, slaughtered wherever they were. The name of this land has changed so many times throughout history, and the name Palestine actually comes from a biblical tribe who inhibited the area known as the Philistines. The Arabs who are indigenous to the region did not call themselves a Palestinian nation until very recently in history. The Jewish people had been kicked out of this land and were in exile for over 2,000 years. But throughout history, Jews from all over the world always wanted to be a part and come back to their homeland. During the Ottoman Empire, when the Turks ruled here, there were Jews and there were Arabs. You can say modern day Zionism started around the time of 1897 during the first Jewish Congress held by Theodore Herzl. And that's essentially where the movement began, where Jews wanted to start coming to Israel and purchasing land. And again, this was completely legal. Anyone could come here and purchase land. The Arabs freely and willingly sold their lands to Jews. You know why? because we live together in peace. My great, great grandfather was one of them. But slowly, as more and more Jews started coming to Israel and buying land, there were some radicals that didn't like this. So terrorist attacks against the Jewish population here in Palestine started even way back then. Have you ever heard of the disturbances of 1908? I love how we call it disturbances, as if it wasn't terrorism. But Arabs actually killed 14 civilians, including three rabbis, just because they were Jewish. After World War I, the Brits and the French divided up the Middle East, and essentially the Brits got the British mandate for Palestine from the Turks. And already in 1917, the British, through the Balfour Declaration, promised a national home for the Jews. This was already in 1917. With the growing anti-Semitism across Europe and across the world, Jews began emigrating to Israel, settling, building kibbutzes, and building their towns. So based on the League of Nations intention to build eventually a Jewish state here in the land of Israel, the Jews came here and built the infrastructure for today's modern day Israel. But you know what? The local Arabs didn't like that either. And once again in 1929, the disturbances of 1929, <clears throat> terrorist attacks. 133 innocent civilians murdered. Let's fast forward a little bit. You guys know what happened in World War II. You know what happened to the Jews in Europe, across Europe? Do you know? Do I need to remind you? Six million slaughtered? The Jews needed a home. But you know what? Guess who was the partner in crime? Guess who was Hitler's greatest friend? The Grand Mufti of Jerusalem. Yep, anti-Semite. So World War II happens and we know how that ended, right? The Allies completely destroyed half of Germany. And you know, that kind of reminds me of a narrative that I'm hearing going on online the past few days of more are dying on this side, so that means they're the good ones. The ones killing a lot are the bad ones because it's disproportionate, right? So let's remember World War II, how many people died in Germany when the Allies attacked? Who were the good ones then? Okay, so World War II ends and Britain decides it's time to end its mandate and decide what's going on here. You know what? The whole world voted. The UN voted on November 29th, 1947 and divided this area, Palestine, into two states, one for the Jews 
and one for the Arabs. The Jews accepted with open arms. They were happy to receive any land to come back after 2,000 years to their rightful land, a place where they would not be suppressed, oppressed, slaughtered. And mind you, they agreed and accepted to a really small amount of land compared to what is today modern day Israel. But you know who didn't accept? The Arabs. The local Arabs that lived here, they didn't accept. They never had a state. It was Britain's. And when Britain offered to give them a state, they said no. And you know what they did instead of saying yes? The day after the British left, Israel's first prime minister, David Ben-Gurion, declared independence for the state of Israel. And you know what happened? That same day, the local Arabs, together with all the surrounding Arab nations, declared full-out war on the new, small, state of Israel. And this, my friends, is why we have Nakba. Nakba is a tragic, tragic situation where more or less 750,000 Palestinians were displaced from their home. Some of which left willingly out of fear. Let's not forget, there was a war, a bloody, gruesome war. So I can understand people who took their kids and left. I get it. I'm a mom. I get it. Some left their homes because the Arab leadership said to them, leave your homes. It's going to be bloody. We are going to slaughter all these Jews. And once we get rid of them once and for all, you guys can come back to your homes. And yes, some Palestinians, along with some Jews, were displaced from their homes in violent ways. And I think it is important to be objective and say, yes, some were displaced in violent ways. There was a bloody war here. I couldn't even imagine what it was like. People fighting for their existence. People had just come three years after the concentration camps and gas chambers in Europe wanted to live, just wanted to live. And the day they declare independence, all the surrounding Arab nations call for the destruction of the Jewish people and the Jewish state. So I can understand why people fought with everything in their power for their new country. April 9th, 1948, Dar Yassin, a Arab village where so many were brutally massacred. But you know what the difference is? is when that happened, the Israeli leadership and all of the media the very next day condemned and said that they were disgusted by the violence and the, and, and the act itself. Whereas on the other side, nothing was ever condemned. Anything was always celebrated as if you were some kind of hero for slaughtering Jews. So 750,000 Arabs displaced from their homes to become refugees. And you know where most of them went? To the surrounding Arab countries who, by the way, to this day, Lebanon doesn't really give them equal rights put them in, in refugee camps, didn't really allow them to work. It's tragic. It really is tragic. I feel for those people. But you know what? At the end of the day, you can't start war and then cry about it after when you've been displaced from your home. You're the ones who started the war. Again, 1947, UN, we accepted, you did not. And from that moment on, all the Jews that had brutally been persecuted against in their Arab countries, Morocco, Algeria, Iraq, Syria, the list goes on and on. They were all persecuted under the Arabs. They fled to the state of Israel. Exactly why the Jews need the right of return. There are 22 Arab states in the world. Arabs should take care of their fellow Arabs. And so I'll say this again, the Arab refugee problem is a consequence of the aggressive war waged against the state of Israel in 1948. And I am certain that had there been no war, the Jews and the Arabs would be living side by side in peace till this day. Okay, let's fast forward history a little bit. Russia, France, America, superpowers. Okay, we got through 1956 with the Suez Canal. 1967, again, once again, Arab nations attack Israel, call for the destruction of the state. You know what happened? In six days, we won. And in 1967, when we won, yeah, you know what? We also got Judea and Samaria and what is known today as Gaza and the Sinai Peninsula as well. You can't wage war against Israel, attack it, try to wipe it off the map. And then when Israel wins the war, say that they're aggressive and colonializing this area and occupying territories that don't belong to them, you wage the war. Israel won. 
Sorry, that's the way it is. You know why Israel had to take hold of the Golan Heights? Because prior to that, when we did not have the Golan Heights, the Syrians used to sit up on top and fire down at the local farmers. No, not the military, the farmers who were trying to grow crops to feed the small nation. When we gained control of Judea and Samaria, or what is known today as the West Bank, do you know who we got that from? From Jordan. And when we got Gaza and the Sinai Peninsula, you know who we got that from? Egypt. Not from Palestinians. There was no official Palestinian nation at that point in time. Five months after the end of the Six Day War, the UN adopted Resolution 242. And in that resolution, basically, it was land for peace. Let's exchange land for peace. And Israel wanted to exchange the land in, of the Sinai Peninsula in exchange for peace with Egypt. But you know what? Instead, we got the War of Attrition, where the Fedayeen and the Egyptians attacked Israel over and over and over again in lots of terrorist attacks. And you know what? We still ended up giving up the Sinai Peninsula in exchange for peace, even after all those brutal attacks. That kind of just goes to show Israel has always wanted peace and has been doing anything it can to achieve it. Unfortunately, most of the time, like today, there just is no partner. 1973, the Yom Kippur War. <laughs> Once again, surprise, surprise, Israel is attacked by all its surrounding neighbors. You know what? We won. Gotta hate us for it, right? Those Jews just keep on winning. The attack came on Yom Kippur, which is the holiest day for the Jewish people. So when people make the argument that we should leave religion out of it, look in your history books. Around this time, this is when the Palestinian Liberation Organization started to form and when the Arabs that had been displaced from Palestine started calling themselves Palestinians. And led by Yasser Arafat and a whole bunch of other people, lots of terrorist attacks started happening, even more than we had been used to, against not only Israelis here in Israel, but also Jews abroad. And some of the really, really famous ones that you may have heard of is the 11 uh, athletes that were slaughtered in Munich, uh, the hijacking of the plane um, in Entebbe. In 1974, uh, students in Malot were held hostage. 27 students slaughtered. 1979, Naharia, terrorists come in from Lebanon on uh, float boats and murder a family in their sleep. 1982, bus line three uh, the bus hijacked, people held hostage, eight killed. These are just a small example of the hundreds of terrorist attacks against innocent Israeli civilians throughout the years. 1987 to 1993, the first Intifada, the Palestinian uprising, a wave of terrorist attacks killing 277 innocent Israeli civilians. But Israel still wanted peace. In 1993, on the beautiful lawn of the White House, everybody signed the Oslo Accords, and yay, everybody won Nobel Prizes, and everybody thought that would be the end to terrorism, and you know, ooh, yay, we, everybody was so happy and optimistic. And really, in 1994, we also managed to sign peace with Jordan. So yay, Israel now has a peace with Jordan, a real peace. We can go there, they can come here. Real peace, Jordan. Israel extremists in 1995 unfortunately assassinated Israel's Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin and this kind of put the peace on hold and you know there were a few terrorist attacks here and there but Israel kind of turned a blind eye and everybody really wanted this peace to happen. In 2000, the Camp David Accords, so basically Clinton and Barack sat together to try to finish what Rabin had started, and they came out with um, a peace agreement between the Israelis and the Palestinians, where Israel accepted almost all of the Palestinian demands, including retreating from territories where Jews were living. Guess what? Once again, Jews accepted, Arabs did not. Does anybody realize a pattern here? Who really wants peace? And who just wants to free Palestine from the river to the sea? What does that really mean, from the river to the sea? That means 
no state of Israel, no Jewish people, wipe us off the map. Where are we gonna go? So 2000 to 2005, second wave of Intifada, and this was a deadly one. Over 1,000 innocent Israeli civilians murdered, suicide bombings, buses exploding, malls being blown up, young people dancing in nightclubs blown up, weddings blown up. Why is nobody talking about the years of terror that the Israelis have been living? Years, decades. Over the past two weeks, all anybody is talking about is Sheikh Jarrah and violence in Al-Aqsa. Where are all the years of perpetrated terrorism against innocent Israeli civilians? Where are the years where you have been offered a peace and constantly refused to accept it? After hundreds of Israelis were slaughtered in Gaza, and as one last attempt for peace, Israel unilaterally disengaged from Gaza, took out all of its civilians, ripped out civilians from their homes, okay? So everyone's crying about ethnic cleansing, about ripping out Palestinians from their homes. Israel ripped out its own Jewish civilians from their homes in Gaza to show one last effort for peace. And you know what? Instead of receiving peace with Gaza, the Hamas terrorist organization started to fire rockets into Israel. And this is not something new. This is since 2005, almost 20 years, that the south of Israel has been under constant rocket fire from Gaza. If that is not aggression, I don't know what is. That is not self-defense. 2006, we're attacked from Lebanon, Hezbollah, you know, like, the, 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 it doesn't even end here. Like, nobody in the region wants us here. Nobody. Israel will always continue to do everything in its power for peace. And you know what? We've done it. 2020, Abraham Accords, the UAE, Bahrain, Morocco, and I hope to see way more countries join because Israel wants to see a real prosperous peace with its neighbors. And you know why those Arab countries have been able to sign peace treaties with Israel? Because they know, they know that we are on the defense. They know that the Hamas terrorist organization is using their innocent civilians as a pawn, as shields for their weapons. And when people ask me the question, how can I sleep at night with the IDF as my military and my government as my government, I can tell you wholeheartedly that my army is the most humane army in the world. Not only do we let the enemy know ahead of time that we're going to attack so that all the innocent civilians can leave, we also send in humanitarian aid. You know why? Because the Palestinian people are not our enemy. It is the corrupt terrorist organizations that are the leadership, that are taking advantage and abusing their own civilian population in some weird, twisted, sick way to make it look like to the world that we are the aggressors, that we are inhumane. How can you call a nation that has been constantly under attack by all of its neighbors since even before its existence an oppressor, an aggressor, fascist. You know why? It's called the double standard. After the horrible attacks of 9-11, nobody told the United States, hey, you don't have the right to defend yourself. And you know what? The US went in to Afghanistan and to Iraq. And you know what? A lot of innocent civilians were hurt. But who were the good guys? And who were the bad guys? There is so much fake news going on and the story has been completely twisted. And for some reason, the narrative online is that Israel is the aggressive state. It's the occupier, it's the conqueror. Israel just wants its right to exist. That's all we've ever wanted and what we will continue to fight for. What would you do living in London, in Paris, in Amsterdam, in Berlin, in New York, if rockets were fired at you for over 20 years? If since the day you've declared independence, you've been constantly attacked by the country surrounding, you've been constantly attacked with terrorist attacks, stabbings in the streets, what would you do? The checkpoints, the walls, I know it doesn't look good. Israeli soldiers, and the mothers of the Israeli soldiers don't want to see those soldiers standing there at those checkpoints. Hell, it's super dangerous for them too. Constantly being rammed over by 
Palestinian drivers or stabbed at the checkpoints. Nobody wants our soldiers to be standing there. But have you ever stopped and asked yourself why? Why are there checkpoints scattered throughout the West Bank? After 2,000 years of being slaughtered and oppressed everywhere in the world, finally we have a state, a strong state, a strong military to defend us. And yes, at times it may seem like an unfair fight. But once again, I beg the question, who is to blame? Is it the country who through its democracy, doing everything in its power to protect its civilians with super sophisticated technologies like Iron Dome, which by the way, also protect the Arab villages inside Israel? Or is it the corrupt terrorist organizations who are using the innocent civilians on the Palestinian side as a shield. My country uses shields to protect me. Their leadership used them as shields for the weapons. Let us pray for better days, for peace, shalom, salam, because that's all we've ever wanted.